First, I'm just honored to be in conversation with y'all, and um, I love the play. I got a chance to see it um, some time ago. Um, as I was sitting here, though, I kept thinking about how I think we, we actually have a lot of language and a lot of resources to help us think about the systemic impact, um, structural impact, institutional impact um, on our communities and how it connects to an epidemic that is HIV. What's been clear to me, I don't know if we've been able to articulate very clearly um, the level of sort of traumatic impact on the spirit, on the heart of black people, black, gay, queer, by people. What I mean by that, like, I, when I think about my own life, I've, I've always been able to theoretically and intellectually talk about HIV. I've been able to talk about safe sex, but I've never really had the words to put to the type of deep, deep shame. Um, shame connected to, to growing up thinking that, like, HIV would be my lot because I was a, a person who was having sex with other men. Um, how do you talk about the guilt that's associated with, um, you know, I remember going to the doctors and getting tested, test done, and every time a doctor would come back to me and say something like, oh, you know, you're fine, and I would go, you have to do it again. Mm -hmm. I, I can't be fine. Partially because I came in here knowing um, that this was to be my lot. Um, and then how did I come to know that? It comes because I had people say things to me, like aunts and our fam you know, people in the community, um, in the church house, um, in the schoolhouse, and, and sort of the educational house, who had reinforced over and over and over again to the point of me believing it like a theology, like a faith. That to be gay, to be queer, to love or to fuck or be intimate with other men is to confine yourself to a life of punishment via this, this this disease. This is what I was sort of believed. So what that meant then was that my actions, that you know, me being like I write about being in parks and, and having sex unprotected, or um, wandering on streets where sex workers worked, waiting for somebody to pick me up, had so much to do. You know, I used to, I like sex, yeah. Um, but a lot of that had less to do with sort of an attraction I like for sex. Um, a big part of it was like a search to fill in the gaping hole that I had developed in my spirit, in my personhood, um, that was there because I had people, institutions, um, you know, a, a range of sort of uh, ideas that had been chipping away at my sense of well-being. And I bring this all up to say because we can do very, like, we can talk about stats, we can talk about the effects of anti-blackness anti -blackness and its impact on our, on our well-being, and not just in a material impact, on the ways we live our lives, the lack of access we have to the types of things we need to survive. But I always keep thinking, for all that we get, have been able to talk about theoretically, intellectually, through our research about those things, we still have yet to grapple with the hurt, those holes, that spiritual pain, the shame that shows up even for those who are in the work, doing the work to end this. Um, and what does it take to do to fix that? What does it take to, to fix the woundedness of the soul? The woundedness of people who have been told that love is not theirs. That lovelessness is ours. That to love yourself, that whether the color of your skin or your full, complex, nuanced humanity, whether, I'm a, whether I have acquired HIV or not, um, what does it take to love the thing that you've been told to hate? And most of us have been taught to hate ourselves. And who's doing that work? Right? And how, I mean, part of the work of, uh, I believe that this play, right, that part of what we can use art as an expressive tool to do is to get at that stuff. Um, and I really feel like, you know, that's where we need to go. And I'm not certain, I'm not certain that we've been able to sort of infiltrate hearts and spirits in a way that can allow somebody to look in the mirror and love the, love the self back that's staring at them. Thank you both. I'm really happy to be talking to you both about these things. And um, if they've been a part of, not as much as I can, in the Accelerate Initiative, um, almost I think since the beginning, um, as a kind of advisor. So um, seeing this process through has been, been really important to me. Um, I think that one of the reasons why, as much as I can, and even talking about Pose and where it's kind of situated now is important is because I, I don't think that we've had the opportunity, particularly as black people, to have art that really reflects 
um, you know, HIV in this particular moment and in ways that really humanizes people. I mean, we've had a lot of bullshit that like, you know, is, you know, the kind of Tyler Perry, the specter of an HIV diagnosis is dead. I mean, all of, there's been a number of like things like that, but there have been very few things that particularly humanized um, and told black gay men's stories in a particular way. And I think about, you know, for me as somebody who's like worked in a range of social justice work over the last, um, going on 20 years now, um, you know, on kind of criminal justice and police brutality stuff and then LGBT stuff and HIV and healthcare stuff and, you know, and the nexus between. One of the things that I find very, very interesting is that, you know, I would sometimes go and do, you know, kind of conferences with like some very well-known like academics and I'm not an academic but like <laughs> so like the few people without PhDs who get invited to those things right, right. so um, you know so I've gone to some of those um, and often it's the only person who will talk about HIV explicitly I think that's sort of changing in the academic space but I would have people come up to me afterwards some very well-known black academics and say thank you for you know talking about that because you know, my brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, this, that, or whatever, and kind of in whispered tones, right? And this is recently. And, you know, and some of those people will do political work or their academic work or their writing work about family members in prison or about other things. But for some reason, you know, HIV kind of remains this sort of like personal shame that people still want to kind of you know, sort of talk about and debate in whisper tones as opposed to the way in which we kind of as a community embrace, uh, say, police brutality as an issue of like state violence as opposed to what that individual did on that particular day, right? And, and I think that we have some work to do to sort of help people understand that sort of framework around HIV as opposed to the kind of personal failure uh, kind of mantra. And I think in some ways, as much as I can, and, and kind of pull some of these things actually help do that. I've seen in my own, you know, family, and I, I've been very lucky. I sort of tell the story all the time that you know I grew up, you know, in Cleveland, in the projects in the 1980s, and there were like, you know, LGBT folks around. My family was friends with folks, right, who were, you know, a range of things we would call gender nonconforming. Now there wasn't the terms we used; it just was the sissies and punks and like the bull daggers and you know. <laughs> the studs and whatever, right? And that just what it is what it was. Y'all, um, y'all hear me? So, and there was no secret about it, right? There was nobody was hiding, nobody was, you know, my parents didn't try to hide it from us or et cetera. And, but even for my mom, you know, who has been a staunch ally from my entire life, frankly, to the community, Pose has meant a lot to her. Mm -hmm. It is, I, she watches it because, you know, she was a young woman in that period and having lost, uh, you know, black gay men, uh, you know, to HIV, to violence mm -hmm. or whatever. And it, it, it signals something for her that it, 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 it uh, uh, draws out. So I do think that we need like sort of both um, sort of political strategies and ways to think about how we help people see it both as a kind of issue of social justice uh, in the way that we think about, you know, the way we do anybody who dies at the end of a police revolver, mm -hmm. right? And the kind of mobilizing that happens. Uh, but I think we also, the, maybe the way to do that is actually kind of the opposite, which is to kind of speak to this hard space that, that gives people the space to uh, kind of collectively experience something, and, and in some cases more, mm -hmm. you know, what's been lost. I mean, I was listening, Kenya mentioned this idea of moral failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be black in the context of the U.S. is to always um, be asked or demanded to, all, to have to sort of supersede all moral standards um, in every way, let alone being black and queer or black and gay, like just to be black. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, our the family, as even a sort of concept, as an idea, um, you know, it's something that's been contested for, for black folk, right? Like, we always have to acquiesce to these ideas. And there's a way that people want to say, you know, what's the black church? 
the black church that sort of raises the ire and sort of uh, allows for many of us to try to acquiesce to um, this higher moral standard. That is, to get HIV is to have done something wrong, and it's a consequence of your moral failure. Right? Um, that's not just black church stuff. You do realize that. Um, it, it's certainly in, imbued by a whole bunch of theological ideas. Um, the last I checked, Mike Pence didn't go to a Pentecostal church. Um, it's, it's Christian sort of, Judeo-Christian sort of values that we have embedded in this culture um, for whom only certain people in this country have been, have been asked to sort of live up to. Um, and last I checked, we didn't have a, a high moral person with moral standards in the White House. But you see, if, if this was another person outside of the thug that's in the White House, then it's a problem. So I think the point that I'm trying to raise is for black folk, you know, um, Evelyn Higginbotham, when we talk to t use this term, politics respectability, which is more than just this idea of us always trying to sort of like one up people or to acquiesce to these ideas. She was writing about um, Southern Christian women in a very particular point in history who pretty much um, had decided like as a way of sort of surviving the onslaught of Jim and Jane Crow that the way to sort of push back against all of the racism that had been thrown their way, the classism, um, the sexism, um, was to sort of alleviate any sort of, uh, any sort of semblance of, of, of anything that could distract. So, you know, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna dress a certain way, be a certain type of way, act a certain type of way to mitigate racial harm. Not because we're trying to be like y'all, but we got enough shit we got to deal with when we walk out in the streets and have to go praise the Lord and then go out there and then be assaulted by people who stand there praising the same God mm -hmm. for the color of our skin. We need to mitigate against that harm. So, you know, it's that thing where it's like, it isn't me telling you to pull up your pants because I just, you know, I want you to sort of be morally upright. I know if you keep your pants down, it's likely whoever you are, a black child, that you're gonna go out in a way that a white child with pants down will, and you look likely get shot for looking like somebody's. So I guess my point is the whole idea is like, well, what does it mean to be black in America but to always feel like we have to fight so damn hard to be seen as being human and normal? And having been taught that any time you fail at that, it's your fault. So you know there are parents, I have no many stories I, talk, I heard from like young people, my own, fa my own family life, who's, when kids came, came out, or like I say, invited them parents in, it had more to do with them saying, oh shit, what harm is going to come to you yeah. as a result of this? Right. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with it. I think that has a lot to do with it. So I do think, <laughs> as much as uh, you know, there is a, a, a piece about um, kind of community and connection uh, that that really matters. But I, but in, in a way, but I also think that the kind of society sort of informs that mm -hmm. through what you have access to and what you don't. Right, so as senior editor at body.com, I just wrote a piece a couple of months ago based on a, a research study that was conducted in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was like focus groups with some young black women under 25 or whatever. And there were things that they talked about. It was a, a study that was about like how they thought about um, you know, PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And um, what they talked about was understanding in the city of Milwaukee, which every year for the last 20 or more years has been named the most segregated city in the United States. But they understood that the, the medical care services in their community were substandard to the, the, where the, the kind of bigger main hospitals that were more well-funded and the more well-funded clinics that were outside of their communities. They understood those dynamics, right? They understood um, you know, that their, uh, you know, kind of access to things were that they didn't have transportation or the way that they would be treated, even if they went to some of these institutions, uh, you know, what would happen. The fact that we live in a country where, you know, even by as kind of middle of the road and, you know, as the Affordable Care Act was, that we still were kind of walking around as though, you know, half the states didn't expand Medicaid, which was, everywhere that expanded has been the most successful part of the Affordable Care Act. And it's been the, the, one of the things that has helped reduce HIV diagnoses, right? So Louisiana, 
which has had the, the two cities, Baton Rouge and New Orleans, have rotated between one and two almost every year for the last 15 years mm -hmm. of being number one or number two cities with the highest HIV rates in the country. But for the first time this year, because they elected a new governor a couple of years ago and they expanded Medicaid, the rates of HIV diagnosis are going down in the state of Louisiana. So I think that when you grow up in a society that tells you like, so this, it's both the kind of communal homophobia and, and those things that are happening, but if you live in a society that says you don't deserve quality health care or access to it, that says something about your possibility. So I do think that part of getting to the place of, um, you know, uh, helping people feel valuable is about challenging and ultimately transforming institutions that actually show them that they're not valuable because they don't have access to it. Yes. Yes. So I do think, <laughs> as much as, uh, you know, there is a, a, a piece about um, kind of community and connection uh, that that really matters. But I, but in, in a way, but I also think that the kind of society sort of informs that mm -hmm. through what you have access to and what you don't, right? So as senior editor at Body.com, I just wrote a piece a couple of months ago based on a, a research study that was conducted in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was like focus groups with some young black men under 25 or whatever, and there were things that they talked about. It was a study that was about like how they thought about um, you know PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, and um, what they talked about was understanding in the city of Milwaukee, which every year for the last twenty or more years has been named the most segregated city in the United States. That they understood that the, the medical care services in their community were substandard to the, the where the the kind of bigger main hospitals that were more well-funded and the more well-funded clinics that were outside of their communities. They understood those dynamics, right? They understood, um, you know, that their, uh, you know, kind of access to things were, that they didn't have transportation or the way that they would be treated even if they went to some of these institutions, uh, you know, what would happen. The fact that we live in a country where, you know, even by as kind of middle of the road and you know as the Affordable Care Act was, that we still were kind of walking around as though, you know, half the states didn't expand Medicaid, which was everywhere that expanded has been the most successful part of the Affordable Care Act. And it's been the, the one of the things that has helped reduce HIV diagnoses, right? So Louisiana, which has had the, the two cities, Baton Rouge and New Orleans, have rotated between one and two almost every year for the last 15 years mm -hmm. of being number one or number two cities with the highest HIV rates in the country. That for the first time this year, because they elected a new governor a couple of years ago and they expanded Medicaid, the rates of HIV diagnosis are going down in the state of Louisiana. Right. So I think that when you grow up in a society that tells you like, so this, it's both the kind of communal homophobia and, and those things that are happening. But if you live in a society that says, you don't deserve quality health care or access to it, that says something about your possibility. So I do think that part of getting to the place of, um, you know, uh, helping people feel valuable is about challenging and ultimately transforming institutions that actually show them that they're not valuable because they don't have access to it. Yes. So we're going to with, you know, and I think if you've heard me talk for two seconds in any of these things, I always talk about, like, just my own personal experience, which I understood homophobia in the larger world growing up, certainly, but that wasn't my experience. My, like I said, my mother's best friend, you know, my Uncle Roger, who would come over in various states of, <laughs> of a look, right? Like, you know, sometimes a wig, sometimes no wig, and a full beat. Sometimes the fur coat. This was the 1980s in the projects of Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. right? My mother's one of her other best friends, an older woman who was a lesbian, mm -hmm. lived up the block, right? Right, do it. So those, all those things were true at the same time that I think that we talk about, like you know, homophobia in the black community. I think that there are some particular dynamics within the black community. Uh, that are uh, that complicate kind of how homophobia shows up. So I think, first of all, for us as black folks, 
For us, I think we certainly experience homophobia more often from black people because that's who we're closer to. And often when I'm in white spaces, they're dealing with me as a black man first and foremost. So like white women are clutching their purses, it's all the you know, like all of that kind of stuff doesn't change because I'm gay. And so therefore, so so my so my experience in, in those kinds of spaces. The homophobia doesn't necessarily show up as such, right? Is it because I'm read first through a very gen masculine and black race sort of thing? So, but in the black community where everybody's black, other kinds of differences are going to kind of play out, right? So, you know, whether it's gender, gender expression, class, skin color, education, etc., right? Homophobia being a mix of that. So, I think to us, it feels that way. The other thing I would say is this, is that I do think, as it pertains to homophobia in the black community, one way that it manifests that I think is different from white folks, I think white folks got the really religiosity and that shit down too. But I think the piece that's different for us is that where the homophobia exists is that it shows up in a way that kind of suggests that, you know, being queer of whatever sort is kind of antithetical to building like a sort of strong black nation, you know, sort of like the politics of like racial uplift, right, that play out in different sort of political sex in the black community, that actually being a, you know, queer person or not heterosexual or whatever is, is a challenge to us being able to progress. That is different, right? And so I think that it has that particular different nuance to it, but I don't necessarily think it is more, yeah. personally. So as a, as a recovering uh, fundamentalist Christian, <laughs> um, as somebody who, who, who had been harmed, so I'm very careful when I talk about spirituality, when I talk about spirit, particularly, and I want to be very clear that um, it's important to name, when we say spirituality, from whence, what spirituality are we talking about? Um, I say that because so many black gay men, and I know because I've counseled a lot of them, have been, I like to, have been harmed because of what I call theological violence. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. That sometimes even to talk about matters of spirituality, or more specifically religiosity, is itself a trigger for a lot of people. Um, and it is a very thing that has caused, for many of us, myself included, a lot of harm that led to mental health issues, um, that led to the type of choices that we've made regarding um, the senses of self, our bodies, so forth and so on. But that said, I'm also very careful to name anything. What, what Kenya laid out was a bunch of structural impediments that are not necessarily the consequence of us as individuals. So I'm very careful about naming anything in us. All right, let's borrow from Toni Morrison, God rest your soul who spent time in this room, who really showed us through fiction how black people in particular have been taught to hate our flesh. By flesh, I mean our personhood, ourselves, this skin, these hands, these eyes, our innards. And there's a way that the medical industry, and I know, and as somebody who's been trained as a therapist, when we're taught to think about sort of um, our inner workings of our, of our lives and beings, there's a way that we've been taught to sort of, um, to point the finger at, at self as if like HIV or, or the, at the choir of HIV or our, the shame we experience as black people in the world, as black queer or trans or non-binary people in the world is somehow in us. And I want to disrupt that a little bit to say that sometimes the sickness, the reason why it can't be individual is because no one comes to shame on their own. That's not no shit you create for you. A collective unit, a society creates that. So my sense of like how you sort of work spiritually is to never ever see what they call in the Christian church sin. As an individual consequence, like sin is not an individual consequence of shit that just fell wrong. The way I understand it is it's ecological. Sin is a consequence of collective harm. So when we think about HIV, its impact, black folk, black, queer, trans, non-binary folk, to deal spiritually is to always think about individuals as always being connected to community, to a whole. The real sin 
is never the queer person, never the shame that, um, that overcomes me, never my fall into whatever. It, it, the real sin is a nation, a society that tells you that your skin color, your blackness, your queerness, your quirkiness, the ways you have sex, the things that you love is wrong, and as a consequence, these things that you get as a result of that is yours to own, and you therefore need to fix that in order to get rid of all the other stuff. That's not how this works. So spiritual, spiritual healing, I think, comes from taking seriously structural impediments as a spiritual matter. Let's use Jesus. Jesus walked into a temple, didn't say everybody pray about the capitalism that's happening in here. But I see all this money being transferred in the church house when it really should be meted out for the sake of the people. That was a structural issue. Do y'all hear what I'm saying here? Yes. So that's the way that I think about turn the tables. <laughs> Kick the table. <laughs> Do you realize that Jesus on the cross, Jesus on the cross, and I'm sorry to get a little church in here, but you know I'm a recovering church. <laughs> But it wasn't so much so. The reason why it was scandalous is because the cross was an empire. That was a tool of the state. Think about it like police shooting. The electric chair. It was persecuted because it was a state action. They saw him as pushing against the state. That said, when I'm thinking spiritual, I'm always thinking structural. Your heart got to be good, but you got to eat too. Your spirit got to be good, but if you don't have access to good health care, then what the hell is that going to matter? To be spiritual is to make sure that everything our people need, they got. So that their heart can be good. And to always remember there ain't nothing right. The sicknesses are out here, let's name them. And if anything, we are, are beholden to that. And in so many of us, because we're beholden to the sicknesses that, are, that sort of are situated in the world that we create, are impacted by it. Just quickly with that, um that spirit is, to me, I also think of, because we also talk about spirituality as kind of like something uh, that, that it's a, an energy that we get from outside as opposed to, so I think it's kind of going back to the Toni Morrison, that kind of sense of, you know, what are the things that bring you peace, contentment, mm -hmm. joy, pleasure, uh, that sustain you, um, you know, as well. And it's not just about a church or about somebody up there. Um, and how to cultivate that, you know, in your life. And the other thing is kind of where Darnell left off, I just think about, you know, spirit as structural, such a, such a brilliant idea. And I, I think about Bob Marley, who said, the belly full, but we hungry. A hungry mob is an angry mob. Mm. And I'm just gonna add, just for the next talk, because this is a whole other conversation, is how we look at wellness and wholeness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think is really important. I'm gonna let Kenya answer because I, I learned so much about sex positivity through his writing over the years. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, well, I, it, it's a, I mean, I'm, it's difficult to speak about this because not to be positive, but I, I would say that for you know friends and people who are close to me, um, the experience is differs for different people. Mm -hmm. um, I would say just um, from the straight sort of statistics, I think I would kind of. I think that we get caught up in the sort of how people contracted HIV. Right. You can't just hear a young man write a piece for us that call it how I contracted HIV is none of your damn business. Right? <laughs> like, so, but there's this, I think that there's sometimes an idea that, um, you know, that it is promiscuity or some kind of otherwise like problematic sexual life that is the cause. And, it's like it's just not there. Most people, including black gay men, contract HIV within the context of an intimate relationship with somebody that they know and knew. Rare, it's much rarer that it's a that somebody who they contracted they, they don't know or they were having you know, multiple partners. Most of the time, it's like through an intimate relationship, like an actual uh, partnership or relationship, right? And then we're not doing anything that's any more like freaky or Reese or whatever than any other group of people at all, right? And so, um, 
Now, I think that like obviously given the, um, the rates of diagnosis, that I think because we come into it with an idea that like you did something wrong, then people begin to like soul search and look for answers. And I'm not saying that there can be uh, you know, uh, addiction issues or, or other things that are kind of at play in a, a person's sort of personal story, but lots of people have addiction that don't contract HIV. Right, in the United States. So like, I think that we, so, so there's that. So to me, the, the, the foundation and the, the way in which I talk to folks, with friends of mine who are, you know, who have contracted HIV or living with HIV and who in the initial phase of their diagnosis was struggling, it's just like, you didn't do anything wrong, right? If, if, if that needs to be part of, the, part of the conversation, right? first and foremost, right? So then the question becomes, you know, what are the other things that you need in order to, um, you know, be healthy? Like, what are the, just the straight up, like the healthcare stuff? Do you need, like, you know, some therapy and some other stuff to deal with, uh, uh, you know, uh, diagnoses or whatever? And I'm not saying that those things are easy for folks because they aren't, but I think that, like, we have to actually get to a place where we don't, get into the like, well, how you contracted HIV or whatever, that there's some kind of like psychological problem with you that led you down some kind of like path, because that's just not the end result for a lot of people in this country who have a whole bunch of shit going on, right? So like, you know, so it's, it's more structural than that. Um, but that doesn't mean that like people don't necessarily need support and care and some like places to go to kind of walk through like what the rest of the journey is going to look like. Thank you for sharing that. The first thing I was going to say is I hope that you could connect with um, Brother Emil here and, and visit his church. I think it's a good example of a spiritual community that is striving to ensure that every person that walks through the door understands that um, they are um, welcomed um, and have an opportunity to worship um, and have the opportunity to do so while being safe and seeing. They also have a wonderful counseling ministry um, that provides a lot of amazing resources to folk who I like to say have been harmed theologically. The thing that I will, uh, I'll give you a story and um, I, I tell this a lot because I'm somebody who spent a lot of time asking myself the questions that you've posed to this room and I think some of us in this room have also asked the same questions. How does one um, love and serve God um, or respond to a call um, and love oneself at the same time, a, see, a self that everybody else seems to hate, including the, the God that everybody tells you hates you. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time doing that. What I can say is that uh, I had a moment where a friend of mine had said to me, I told them that I was gay. They, they, they were, we were both really churched at the time. I was preaching um, and had been really, I guess, successful in ministry. But I had also gotten to a point where I had made a decision that I was going to refuse to give my love, my devotion, my attention to a God who I did not see. And, refuse, and, and, and at the same time, I refused to give love and attention and devotion to a self that I did see. Like I looked in the mirror and saw my reflection and couldn't love myself back, but love this guy that I couldn't even have act, couldn't touch, couldn't see. Like how is that happening? And so I told him, you know, he said, aren't you scared to go to hell? And I said, huh, well, if by going to hell you made lying about who I am, who I understand myself to be, lying, a, a lying to a God that supposedly knew me before I was formed in the womb. I, I guess I'm lying then, right? Like about these urges, the desires, the love that I have. If it means that I need to lie to this God that's supposed to be all knowing, to get into heaven, which to me sounds like a lack of integrity, then I'd rather go to hell for telling the truth than go to heaven for telling a lie. Now, I say that as a person who, when I said those words, it felt like my whole world was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. 
especially as a church, you know, I was like shouting. I, you know, I go to church where he's shouting. <laughs> you know, like he's speaking tones. I lay hand on people, they pass out. I mean, that's how church I was, right? <laughs> so y'all have to understand, like, like, I literally like laid hands on people like big dudes and they like pass out. So I like, you know, I believed. <laughs> so to make that type of claim was um, a signal to me in my, th- in my walk that I had become serious enough to love me enough to put the same faith that I put in heaven and this ideas and all everybody else's conception of God and their faith, even as I was going to churches and shouting down those churches and laying people out with, with the fuck, the anointing and putting money in their, in their pockets and I would go home trying to figure out how to take myself out of here, that to me don't seem like the type of theological love that a God who's supposed to be agape wants us to experience. So what I would say to you, and that's in short, it's a journey. Some of us have been socialized, that means we have been taught for a long time to hate ourselves. Whether that is because somebody told us the Bible says so, or the world. And it does not necessarily occur overnight that you want to love yourself back. But your questions already indicate to me that you have a sense that something that you've been taught is not necessarily right. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking questions about it. So what I'll leave you with is this, yeah? I think that the the thing that is demanded of any of us who is is alive and blessed enough to be breathing and have blood running through our bodies, who have enough unction to ask questions and to give love, um, is to take seriously that because you are here and because you are created, meaning that you are actually the materialization of God on on this planet, that you're supposed to give yourself that love. At the end of the day, I often say that I had to do away with everybody else's God to claim my own. I had to have many funerals. Mama's God, whoever God, pastor's God, had to bury that. In order for me to have access to the God, the spiritual presence, that I needed in order to survive. So what you're asking is permission, I think, to know that you are okay. That what you're actually asking, you ain't crazy. You're asking, how is this possible for me not to be able to love Carnival and also the church? I often felt God in Carnival because you know what I found in the church? The lack of love. I found love in the clubhouses and the house music was born when we're sweating. That's where I found love. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. If you hear nothing else, know that you're loved. You are loved, and often your ministry might be to serve at that carnival, Mm -hmm. or to dance there and sweat there, and love the hell out of yourself there, and to live. Now you connect with Camille, you can go to his temperature. (laughs) (laughs) 